Did you know that March is International Women's Month? So what better sponsor for today's podcast than Michael Lewis's latest book, Fight Like a Girl, Women Warriors Throughout History. It's a great book, an easy read, and really insightful. A compilation of 25 of the toughest, bravest, most badass women who ever lived, and an acknowledgement of their amazing military accomplishments. I wasn't even aware most of these warriors existed, which is somewhat baffling as their bravery and exploits were unbelievable. It's already generating great feedback. The review in the Boston Globe reads, In lively prose and beautifully illustrated by Hilaronis, Lewis shows the courage, resourcefulness, and leadership of these remarkable women. And the Midwest Book Review had this to say, Fight Like a Girl is inspiring nonfiction reading and a fine survey of relatively unknown women whose efforts changed the world. What's extra cool is the fact that Hilaronis, the amazing artist behind the illustrations, is herself a veteran. If you're interested in getting your hands on a signed copy, go to lewisbooks.com. That is L-E-W-I-S books.com, and you can order from there. They ship out globally. That's lewisbooks, L-E-W-I-S books.com. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we have got on a very interesting guest. She is the Pandemic Ethics Scholar at the Democracy Fund. And this is Julie Panessi. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. No doubt. Happy to have you here. So I've done a brief intro right there, but for people who are not familiar with who you are, please tell them a little bit about you, Julie. Uh, sure. Um, my last uh, six months, I guess, six, eight months has been a pretty dramatic ride. So now I do things like this. I talk, you know, I'm on podcasts and uh, do interviews and give interviews and things like that. But as of, um, you know, prior to last September, I was a professor at a university in Canada and I taught ethics, ancient philosophy, political philosophy, things like that. I have a PhD in ethics um, and ancient philosophy. And then in September of last year, I was terminated with cause for failing to comply with university mandate. And in November, very fortunately, uh, picked up by the Democracy Fund, which is a charitable civil liberties organization in Canada as their pandemic ethics scholar. Awesome. So let's go back a little bit. I want to get into this story, but mm -hmm. I'd like to find out a little bit more about you. Where are you from? What was growing up like? How did you get into the world that you're in? Wow, interesting question. Um, I think in some sense where I am now and even where I was in academia was kind of an unlikely story. Uh, I was born in North Vancouver in British Columbia. Um, I was a very dissatisfied high school student. Um, my poor parents could hardly get me out the door to go to school. I thought it was <laughs> a waste of time and and became very creative at coming up with ways to avoid having to go at all costs my poor dear parents i mean <laughs> um and then they i mean i wasn't terribly interested in going to university because i thought well if it's just going to be more of this then surely there are better things a person can do with their life but they encouraged me to go and um i just registered as a liberal arts student and i had picked my four classes i think you know, classics, English, art history, things like that. And I had to pick a fifth one. And my dad said, well, I took philosophy when I was in medical school. You might like that. And I said, mm, I'm not really interested in psychology. And he said, no, no, philosophy isn't psychology. I've come to realize that <laughs> psychology is actually really fascinating. But yeah. my 17-year-old self did not think this was the case. So mm. I said, no, I don't want to do that. But okay, fine. I have to fill something in in the fifth blank, right? So, uh, so I took philosophy. And from the very first day, I had this amazing professor he thought what I had to say and the questions I asked were interesting. And then I discovered this beauty and this um, like this glorious thing where you could sit in a room with another person and ask them questions and have this interesting conversation. And I was like hooked from the first day when I was 18. And then no longer was I thinking about school as this thing that you had to endure. But um, but I went on and did as much of it as I possibly could <laughs> and stayed for as long as I could. Uh, and then I went on to teach at universities in Canada um, and the States. Are you surprised that you ended up in academia, given, given that you didn't even enjoy school and didn't yeah, want to totally, go to university? Totally. I was not a bookworm. My parents were not academics. I don't actually have, I think I have one cousin who is also a professor, but I, I came from um, um, a family of uh, my dad's side of really professionals. 
Um, but academia, yeah, it was an unlikely fit. I have since, I'm fascinated by people's, um, you know, personality, w what it is that motivates people and how is that different from one person to the next. And mm. so I came across a few months ago in conversations with my best friend about the Enneagram system. I don't know if you're into that at all, if you know about the Enneagram personality test, but it's yes, like, I think so. You know, so there are sort of nine different personality mm -hmm. types, right? And usually when people take it, they're kind of split and it's hard for them to figure out which type they are. And sometimes they're split across. So they're, you know, I'm a little bit of a two and a little bit of a nine. For me, I was an undeniable hardcore number four. I don't think I scored anything for any other category, right? Mm -hmm. And a number four is the individualist artistic type. Okay. Um, and that right, like resonated with me right away because I've always felt this kind of skepticism. If I start agreeing with the majority of people, I think, well, that can't be right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then I think, okay, well, not that I'm, I don't think I'm an irrational skeptic. I hope not anyway, although probably some people would say that I am. But when, when my ideas or beliefs start to fall in line too much with the group, I'm kind of like, well, now it's time to check them. Let, let's look and see, right, if that's legitimate. Um, so yeah, I, I'm kind, in some sense, it's not surprising that I have found myself on the anti-narrative side of what's going on now, because I'm always an outlier in mm -hmm. some sense, whatever I'm doing. And my other, so academia is one thing I do. I'm also a painter, although I haven't done much of that lately, but um, I think artistic ways of expressing oneself and being creative, which is really like a matter of breaking rules and pushing boundaries and questioning norms, right? Mm -hmm. That's what, what creativity is, I think, largely. And so whether or not that's through philosophy or uh, painting or what we're doing today, having conversations with people is really creative mm -hmm. and, and you through, through your music and other endeavors. Um, Creative people, there isn't a lot of room for creativity these days, I think, because creativity is like going against some accepted pattern or standard of behavior. And we don't have, I don't think we have a lot of room or tolerance for that right now. Yeah, it seems like it's morphed into the opposite in many cases. I've been uh, yeah. <laughs> very disappointed by many of my fellow artists and musicians and creatives over the past couple of years who uh, seem to, to be have reckless. become... It's gone. <laughs> it's not there. It's not there. It's been, uh, I could probably count on two hands the number of musicians globally who have vocally taken a stand against anything that's happened in the past two years. I can name many more who uh, took the opposite position, which is, uh, which is maybe a shame. But uh, here we are now. So tell me a little bit more about your former role at university. You were a professor of ethics, is that correct? Yeah, ethics. So I taught, I, I wrote a PhD on ethics and a thesis on ethics and ancient philosophy. So I taught courses in, in, in sort of those two areas. So I would often teach a second year ethical theory class and then some applied ethics classes, healthcare ethics, um, and then history of philosophy. So I taught Plato and Aristotle, the ancient Greek philosophers, you know, those, those kinds of things. And one thing that you realize, I think when you have a background in the history of philosophy and the history of ethics is you realize that though a lot of has changed about the human race and certainly technological advancements are so different not just in degree but in kind from where they were 2000 years ago but the the struggles that we have in terms of our humanity are no different at all right we still struggle with how to communicate with each other we still struggle with how to live together when we disagree we still struggle with how to be courageous and when it's required of us and um we struggle with guilt and conscience and all these things and nothing new under the sun uh yeah. in terms of ethics we might understand moral psychology a little better you know we might understand things like what motivates human beings or maybe we've developed more frameworks to, you know, look at problems or thought experiments. But I think basically, in virtue of being human, we, we've grappled with the same things for as long as we've been alive, and we will probably always continue to do so. And, and though I hate to be kind of pessimistic, I'm not sure we'll get any better at it. I mean, there, there's a hope that we might, but I think, mm. you know, in some sense, we, um, we're, we're fundamentally imperfect. That's beautiful, I yes. think because we're all imperfect in slightly different ways. And we, we kind of need to stop 
denying and and rejecting and feeling badly about that and just recognizing that that's what makes us unique and all of those imperfections can be I don't know, this is going to sound kind of hokey, but I think can be kind of woven together to create something truly beautiful, like this idea Mm -hmm. that there's beauty in the messiness. And I don't think we make enough room for that anymore. We don't make and and, and question asking and conversation and all those things are kind of messy because you're vulnerable, right? And Mm -hmm. you reveal, you put yourself in a position where you could be revealed to another person as not knowing something, as not having an impen- you know, uh, an infallible position, as not yes. knowing more than the other person. And that's an uncomfortable, vulnerable, sticky situation to be in. And I think we want to avoid it at all costs now. We're losing so much, I think, mm. in the process of doing that. You know? Yeah, you've made so many interesting points there. I mean, you said something that I often say, which is, uh, you know, it's this idea I've been thinking of, which is that human beings are, we're exactly the same as we've been. We're the same as our ancestors. When people look at history, they like to imagine that people were just stupid or ignorant or savages or dumb and that we have significantly evolved. I mean, people will even look back 100 years ago, look back at 1922, and they'll be like, oh, wow, we're so much more evolved and different from those people. I'm like, no, we are exactly the same. You could go back to the year 22 or 1022. We are the same. We only have two advantages as modern human beings. We have better stuff. We have more technology, right? We have more, te- but anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we have more and better stuff, as in tech, Material. everything from what's allowing us to communicate right now to our smartphones and our cars and so on. We have tech, and we have the advantage of being able to learn from our predecessors. Those wow. are really our only two advantages. We, we're not smarter physically. We're not. We we've, we've regressed physically, if anything, um, but we're not. Th- that that's all we've got. So if we do not take advantage of being able to learn from the predecessors, then we just keep repeating the same stuff over and over and over again. The same cognitive errors, the same tribalism, the same individual or collective stupidity, the same conformity and desire not to question anything and absolutely you know, listen to an authority no matter what it is. Um, all of these things, it's like, well, that's always been the case. We've always had moral panics. We've always had like mass psychoses that happen in different ways, sometimes politically, sometimes religiously, sometimes just social or cultural, sometimes based on um, a virus, whatever it could be. It could be caused by anything. I mean, remember the millennium bug moral panic? Oh, the world is falling down. Everything, you know. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know. What are, what are your thoughts on that idea? It's so interesting. I think that. Um... Yeah, and in some sense, we don't use either of those toys or as well, <laughs> right? Like we, uh, the kind of historical amnesia you talk about. Mm. I think you're probably right. We've always had that, but I wonder if we have it more now because we don't have the skills we've had in the past to remember. So when the um, when the printing press was invented and we moved away from this oral tradition where we had to exercise our memory in order to retain our stories and communicate with each other, it's like, it's a muscle, right? The memory is, is like a muscle and the ability to tell stories. And now we don't need any of that because we can always, I mean, not only do we have paper and pens and books and things like that, but mm. now we have instantaneous methods of recording information and communicating, right? I mean, sometimes I'm busy doing something else. I'm washing the dishes or taking care of my daughter or getting in the car. And then I grab my phone and use the voice memo thing and record something. And then it's, I don't have to remember it. Mm-hmm. But in with the benefit of that technology, are we also possibly losing the ability to retain lessons from the past, right? I, um, I know Walt Whitman was really, uh, you know, the American poet was very famous for saying that after great civilizations have fallen and we've lost their their governments and their architecture and their works of art are gone, what remains are their ideals, mm. right? The ideals of of democracy and courage and civic virtue and artistic prowess. And um, but for those things to remain, we have to remember them. Yes. You have to be able to remember them. And now, and, you know, we don't have to get into a discussion of, of, of the Nazi situation, but I do wonder if one of the things that makes us so reluctant to have discussions about 
the connection between what's going on now and what happened in the 30s and 40s in Europe mm -hmm. um, has to do with just a, an inability to engage with any part of the past. Yes. And, and an inability to know how to do that and how to have those conversations because it's so distant from us, so removed. It almost feels like it's so much a part of the past that it didn't happen, that it isn't real. Mm -hmm. But as you, I think, quite rightly point out, we're still humans. We faltered then. Yes. We faltered a thousand years ago. We have faltered every time. We have thought it was okay for one person to own and control another person. Mm -hmm. We faltered every time in history when we thought it was all right to say that one person matters more, one person's mm -hmm. opinions matter more. Every time we thought it was okay to take this person or this group of people and, and cast them outside of society. Every time we do that, we falter. And just because it's happening now in 2022, in the House of Commons in Canada doesn't mm -hmm. make it any more morally justified and it shouldn't fly under our moral radar any more than it did at any other point in history. No. Well, as we said, people always like to think that people like to think that they are different and people also like to think that the situation is different. And so therefore that makes it justifiable. Right. Mm -hmm. So anyone who, you know, a German who lives in 2022 wants to admit that they are, they want they would like to believe that they have nothing in common like they're a whole different species they're a whole different type of human being to yeah. the germans who were in you know 1930s and 40s who were either directly or indirectly complicit with the atrocities that happened here there that's not the only example we can think of many examples over the past 100 years alone um and also people don't like to see themselves in any sort of dark or negative light so everyone always wants to imagine that in history, they would have been the hero. You know, they would have been the ones who hid the Jews in the houses. They would have been the ones who liberated the slaves. They would have been the ones who stood against the incorrect majority opinion on many things. But that is not the truth. And I can totally understand why someone doesn't even want to spend the time to really look into these things and consider them deeply because it's really it's very unpleasant and it's really horrible to think about yourself being capable of doing something that's very inhumane. But I think that you are far more likely to end up doing that and supporting it or being complicit in it if you don't even consider that possibility and you don't consider that reality. I mean, I, I think in, in this two year period, one of the things that well, I think one of the reasons I've had the approach I have is because I've really spent a lot of time prior to all of this. I've spent quite a lot of time, way more time than average, really looking at dark parts of human history and really, really kind of thinking of them and putting myself in the situation and thinking, OK, if something like this were to ever arise in any form, who am I going to be in this story? Right. Am I going to be am I going to be the victim? Am I going to be the perpetrator? Am I going to be the majority who just watches and doesn't do anything, even if I don't really like it? But. I'm kind of scared. I want to keep my job. I don't want to be punished, whatever. I'm, I just kind of go along with it. So I've spent a lot of time thinking about that in the past. And, you know, I've read Ordinary Men, the Gulag Archipelago. I've looked into the Rwandan genocide, like all lots of horrible things that have happened in the past when some of those things are really unpleasant to read. But I think if you don't do, I hate the term do the work, but I think if you don't do that work, then reflective work. Right? Yeah, that reflective work. Then when it comes around, if it comes around, you you're you're kind of blindsided and you end up just going with the crowd you end up just going with the majority cuz you don't want to you know fear is fear is very powerful fear controls people and um we we we've, we've really seen that especially in the past couple of years that's so interesting look can we go back to the um the the heroes the the villains and mm. heroes and dark personalities because i i've been thinking about this a lot too and uh what i mean all of our great stories all many of our great stories, blockbuster movies anyways, maybe, right? Um, things that really draw us, that captivate our attention, stories that have stood the test of time. There are, there are usually three categories of people. There are heroes, villains, and victims. Mm. Would that be fair to say? Am I missing something? Or would I think, it be at I, least I, I, I think a big group is bystanders. Uh, okay, okay, let's hold on to that. That's really okay. interesting. So we've got heroes, villains, victims, and bystanders. Mm -hmm. Well, who does everyone want to be? Hero. The hero. But statistically speaking, heroes are always the smallest number of people in a story. Mm -hmm. 
right? Heroes are always anomalous. They are always outliers. They're always the one to stay. They're the Rosa Parks who sits down on the bus when no one else does. They're, they're the, uh, the person who stands up in a crowd when no one else does. They're, mm-hmm. they're the, the, the lone tankman standing by himself in front of the tank about to roll. They're always anomalous. So chances are we are not going to be the hero. Mm-hmm. Chances are we're going to be someone else. And I think it's interesting that we are also very drawn to these dark personalities, right? We're, yes. We love the... And, and okay, so you're going to make fun of me because like the most recent villain in a movie I can think of is something like in the Batman movies, but I'm, I'm okay. sure there are many better examples than that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? So we're very drawn to that. We're very intrigued by um, the, the, the worst things that human beings are capable of and a kind of diabolical sort of evil. And then a really large group much bigger than heroes and villains are the victims. Nobody wants to be a victim. Mm-hmm. Because there's weakness in that. Yes. Being controlled by another person means that you aren't enough of a human yourself to be able to prevent that. Mm-hmm. And then, I, yeah, the, the bystanders, right? The people who stand by, watch someone be victimized, mm-hmm. let villains do it. But they're not really a villain themselves because yeah. they don't have the creativity and the, the the courage it takes mm-hmm. a certain amount of courage to be bad right mm-hmm. uh, and they don't have the courage to be or the creativity to be a hero either yeah and i think i think that's the biggest group it might be the biggest group and, yeah. and really interestingly um i taught a course on evil the philosophy of evil years ago i didn't know very much about it before i started it was one of those courses you're given you know so i think someone else was on maternity leave or something so i stepped in to do this i thought well this is interesting i'll have to read about this and um it turns out that some of the most interesting literature in the philosophy of evil is not so much about evil itself but about bystanders who allow bad things to happen right so um, hannah arendt for example who covered the trial of adolf eichmann who was one of the main organizers of the holocaust you know she she gets to the trial and she thinks okay so this is going to be fascinating because i'm going to find this really uh creative diabolical evil genius who else could possibly be responsible for something so horrendous Mm -hmm. as the mass execution of millions of people she was sure that's what she was going to find and it wasn't she said she she watched this man uh, a really diminutive little figure he's kind of bald and he has glasses and he's wearing a suit and he just kind of sits there and he's meek and mousy looking and um, he just says over and over and over again i was just following orders mm-hmm. right and she says that this when you when you see yourself not as a as a powerful moral agent but as just a cog in a wheel as just just Surely there can't be any harm in just following orders, just standing by, just allowing things to happen. But I think, I mean, now that bystander group is like, well, was an enormous part of of the world's population, but it's maybe shifting a little bit now because I think some people are waking up and saying, I don't want to, I don't want to stand by this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't want to stand by governments that say you don't have a right to stand in the street and wave your flag anymore. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to bystand that. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on what's going on in Canada? Because I saw yet yesterday I tweeted what's going on in Canada. That tweet alone went viral. I literally tweeted what's going on in Canada and it went viral. Um, what is going on in Canada? I mean, is that I'm from... a rhetorical question or are you? <laughs> no, 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 like it's, it's a, it's a real question. I mean, it, it's strange because I, I'm from England and at this stage in the game, you know, England went through its bizarre period, but England has actually the, is actually the first country in the Anglosphere to drop all the restrictions. All I restrictions are dropped. Everything. I made the announcement that day. I watched. Yeah, it. everything. Everything it is. Real. It's done. Totally out out the woods. Um, people still should be vigilant, I believe, but England is England is done. But then you're seeing places like Canada, Australia, New Zealand much of Western Europe, France, Italy, um, you know, they seem to be, I don't know if they're getting, some of them seem to be getting worse. Oh, Germany and Austria as well. Some of them seem to be getting worse in this regard, whereas other places are returning back to a semblance of normality. I don't know where Canada fits in that. 
Well, I don't know if it knows either. I think we have a bit of an identity crisis because we have one thing going on in federal politics and then we have another thing going on provincially. And we've actually seen a number of provinces uh, make plans to lift the mandates in Ontario where I live is the most recent one. And they've uh, decided that the vaccine passport system will be gone as of March 1st, or at least that's okay. that. So there are plans in place. Uh, and at last check yesterday, I believe seven of the provinces oppose the Prime Minister's invocation of the Emergencies Act. Seven, seven out of how many? Seven out of, what do we have, 13 provinces and territories? Okay. Um, and while, though, in the House of Commons, our Prime Minister and his Liberal MPs just continue to hold the same line um, that vaccination is our way out of this. We're going to hold the mandates. Not only are we not going to make a plan, an exit strategy of some kind, right, as we've seen in the UK, for example, mm -hmm. as we're seeing in some of the provinces, not only are we not going to do that, um, but we're not even going to debate the people who are asking for debates about the scientific and political validity of the mandates. We're not going to meet with the people on our doorstep. So just to give you a sense of the geography here, in Ottawa, where the uh, the um, a lot of the trucks are lined up on a street that's at the base of the hill uh, where the House of Commons meets. Mm -hmm. So you have our highest elected officials in the House debating each other about democracy, about what Canadians really think, about what the protest is really about. And less than, goodness, I don't even know, I'm like less than 500 meters away. Someone's going to write in and say, no, no, it's that's not right. But, you know, it's a very <laughs> You can see that building very clearly. You can see the architectural detail of that building. And I gave a speech on the, the trucker flatbed um, the Monday that the house was supposed to return to session, I think. And it was so surreal, you know, speaking to the to the group of protesters while the MPs are talking about the state of democracy in Canada, supposedly, mm -hmm. you know, it was like, um, you could come down and talk to us. Yes. And, and we're seeing that a lot of MPs now, um, mostly from the opposition party, which are the conservatives now, but also a couple of uh, liberal MPs who are saying like a lot of Canadians have concerns about these mandates, which is not about the vaccination issue. Mm -hmm. This is a freedom of choice political issue. What we object to is the state getting involved in people's personal medical choices. Mm -hmm without constraint, without restriction. And I just watched before we hopped on here, one of the liberal MPs, I'm not sure who it was, but was saying, you know, this protest is not about, it's not about mandates. It's not about concerns about vaccines. It's not about freedom. Well, I, I don't know if that MP has, has been around, you know, talking to the truckers, talking to the protesters on the street, but the ones I spoke with will certainly say, this is about preserving a country in which poorly defended, poorly demonstrated health policies are just levied on a population without a plan for escape, without the option for reasonable exemption. Oh, and by the way, now we're going to enact the Emergencies Act, which gives the government the possibility of many more unrestrained actions like seizing bank accounts mm -hmm. of people who choose to donate to this cause, right? So it's a it's it's kind of a mess politically. We're also seeing in our house when opposition party MPs speak, our prime minister walks out. I mean, it's a really mm -hmm. um, yesterday uh, our prime minister accused MP Melissa Lanceman, I believe, very in Toronto, and she's the descendant of Holocaust survivors, mm -hmm. and he accused her of siding with people who wave swastikas. And she demanded of him an apology, not just to her, but to to every other, you know, MP who is supporting this protest. And not only has he failed to give her one, but he walked away. Mm -hmm. So we have a crisis that doesn't it's a it's a crisis of politics and a crisis of national identity. And, and as we were talking about at the beginning, it's like a crisis of how do we talk to each other if we can't even see our um the leader of our country mm -hmm. in new conversations in the face of disagreement with our members of parliament, how are we to expect that we're going to see that kind of productive conversation in families, in, in friend groups, in, in businesses? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think we, yeah, I think we have an identity crisis, a political crisis, a moral crisis, mm -hmm. communication crisis, you name it, you know? How is it that so many people who proudly call and define themselves as liberals have become so obviously illiberal? Well, you know, uh, liberal comes from a Latin word for free. Um, exactly. What it is to be a classical liberal anyway, you know, in the vein of someone like the philosopher John Locke is, is, is to support the fullest, I think, is to support the fullest scope of individual human freedom that's possible. Because mm -hmm. um, I've noticed this in, I mean, on a nation level, but also on a city and state level. It's mm -hmm. been the case that the places that pride themselves on being liberal and being democratic mm -hmm. have genuinely had the most authoritarian responses. You can see this in the USA. All of the red states, as far as I'm aware, are free. There's no there's no mandates. There's no vax yeah. passports. There's no any of this and no no mask mandates, anything. And then the, you know, places like California, New York, New Jersey, uh, Hawaii, all of those, they've got the opposite. Similar, I mean, again, if you look at the Western world, it's places like Canada, Australia, mm -hmm. New Zealand, Western Europe, like these places that are supposed to be liberal. I mean, it's it's so it's actually kind of it makes me chuckle a bit when you're dis describing the pol the Canadian politics and you're there saying, you know, this is the leader of the Liberal Party and the liberal. And I'm, I'm thinking what the word liberal actually means. I think that it's, what, it's, yeah. It's <laughs> come up there once. So okay. one is, what does it mean to be a liberal? And mm -hmm. what is a liberal supposed to be for? And are mandates of any kind really consistent with political liberalism? Mm -hmm. Like that's one kind of question, right? And then I think the second question, which is kind of the, the earlier one you asked, which is how did we get here? Like how did mm -hmm. we get to this place where um, liberals, uh, you know, the, technically the liberal party in Canada or Democrats in the US um, are so, as you say, authoritarian. And uh, I mean, there's a lot that, that, that I think <laughs> needs to be investigated there. But one thing I have noticed is that we seem to have replaced in a broad general sense, in a, in a collective sense, we've kind of replaced the value of freedom with concern for safety. Yes. Do you think? Yes, yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, it's crazy. In um, November 2019, so prior to all this kicking off, I had a tweet which said something like, um, most people pretend to value freedom and liberty more than safety and security. Um, but yeah. that's not true. And in the right circumstances, you'll find that to be to be the case. Something along those lines. It, it was like scarily prescient. And, and then like three months later, the world slipped into everything that's been going on over the past two years. And it was just like, oh, wow. OK, now that's clearly yeah. the case. Yeah, it's, I'm not, I mean, historically, I'm not exactly sure how or why that happened. Uh, one feeling I have is that the safety story is an easy one to tell and an easy one to buy, mm -hmm. right? So if you, and it's an easy one to, um, you, you can, you can get people to buy it by tapping into things that we're already very psychologically sensitive to. So mm -hmm. especially with mothers and grandmothers, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can um, use fear-based language to suggest to someone that there is a serious threat to the things they care about and that they will no longer be safe or the things or the people they care about will no longer be safe. It seems just, just as a matter of fact that you can get them to do just about anything. Yes. The freedom story is harder to tell, I think. It's harder to explain why it matters. It's harder to show why a loss of freedom of expression will matter to your life or in the long run. Mm -hmm. The other thought I have is um, a week or so ago, a couple of weeks ago now, I guess I had the pleasure of interviewing Jordan Peterson and, you know, being a psychologist, he has a lot of interesting things to say about why we've gotten ourselves trapped into this fear language or this cycle of fear that we don't seem to have the resources to escape from. And very controversially, but really interestingly, he had a gender story to tell about it. And he said, you know, and, and just what I said, which is that women especially are very concerned about the safety of the people they protect, you know, mm -hmm. women especially. Um, he said, but when you scale that and you make that concern a political concern and you make decision makers 
women, large as there are more women in politics now, right? You have to tell me what you think about this afterwards because it's so it's so controversial. But I think his point was when so many women have come into positions of power and key decision-making roles and are easily paralyzed with fear, you get a safety culture dominating our political discourse. Mm -hmm. And that has displaced a more kind of libertarian freedom-based approach to thinking about how to ground a democracy. So the other question I think is really interesting is um, fear and safety. That's interesting mm. and everything, but are they democratic concepts? I mean, are, is there anything, I, I haven't actually looked at this, but is there mm. anything in the Canadian constitution and the American constitution? How many times does the word safety appear? Um, in American, I'm not sure. Right. I'm not an expert on this. I'm not the right person to ask. Me neither. We'd have to. Um, <laughs> but I imagine, I imagine not very much in the American Constitution, if at all. Yeah, and 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 not to the best of my knowledge in the Canadian one, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a Charter of Rights that's embedded in our Constitution now, and it's it looks a lot like um, the American one. We talk about fundamental freedoms and civil liberties, like freedom of expression and freedom of conscience and things like that. Um, the the important point here is, it might be good to be safe, mm -hmm. but it's not clear that that's what our country was founded upon. Mm -hmm. So when you have political actors, when you have our representatives making decisions on the basis of safety rather than on the basis of civil liber liberties, mm -hmm. I think that's why we have a political crisis right now because we're getting too far away from the fabric of what created us and what founded us and what our laws are ultimately based on in the first place. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's my crazy wild hypothesis. Yeah, no, it's a, you've made some interesting points there. And I think there's, I think there's also an, another important distinction to be made. And this has been largely ignored again over the past two years, just like lots of other things, which is there's a big difference between safety and the illusion of safety. Mm -hmm. totally different things, right? And I would say all of the stuff we're talking about is about the illusion of safety. It's not about actual, it's not about actual safety. It's about making people, you hear people even the language, right? Feel, feeling safe, right? That, that made me feel unsafe. That made me feel safe, right? I would argue that the entire mask shenanigans, it's about feelings. Yeah. It's about feelings. It's not about safety. It's about feelings. It's about making people feel comfortable, feel like they're doing something. It's making people feel a certain way it's all emotional, right? I mean, to this day, there's still no conclusive evidence that these surgical or cloth masks do anything quite, quite the opposite. Same there's with a lot of the, same with, same with, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. Same with the, a lot of, all, honestly, all I've opposed every single, I've, I oppose every single measure and did from the very beginning. Um, not because I want people to die or I want people to be unsafe or whatever, but because they're, they're emotional. They're mm -hmm. emotional. They're not, they're not scientific. They're not, um, they're huge infringements on civil liberties. They have gigantic downstream impacts, which mm -hmm. were very predictable from physical health to mental health, to the economy, to children's development, to inflation and everything that comes with that, to supply chain issues. It's all manifesting now. I mean, I was talking about this all back in 2020 while people were still Starting, scream screaming probably. at me. We won't know. I mean, you think about, you mentioned the effects of children. Oh. I was watching a video the other day of a maybe three, four year old who's just screaming, trying to get his mask on while someone is, and, and we, you know, we know that children are not as statistically. Never were, never were. But um, it's interesting, the point you make about this illusion of safety, this like this security blanket of, mm. of safety. And when you couple that with, I think we have like a pandemic of outsourcing our thinking. Yes. We want, right? We don't want, I mean, we kind of live in an era, don't we, where if we can, get someone else or something else to do work for us, we will. Mm. We have, I mean, our phone does who knows what. I'm sure my phone <laughs> does many more things I don't know it does. We have little things that go around the house in vacuum now. We mm. have Alexa to tell us to turn on the, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> and we, we do anything possible so that we can get off the hook from having to do work. So it's not at all surprising that when it comes to doing like the hard scientific research that's needed in order to make an informed medical choice, mm -hmm. or when it requires doing some research about what's going on in your country politically, or, or if you're trying to understand how to build up your relate, I mean, all these things take work, they take thinking, they take independent critical thought. I, I, I think it's not surprising we're saying to other people, the experts, so to mm -hmm. speak, 
do that for me. You let me know what to do. And then you let me know how long I have to do it for. Yes. When you couple that outsourcing of thinking with this desire to feel safe, you have people who will succumb to any kind of fear messaging mm -hmm. by doing just about anything for as yes. long as they're told to do so. And I don't think, you tell me what you think about this, but um, I don't think that lifting the mandates in particular jurisdictions is time for popping the champagne bottle yet because we don't have a solution to those underlying problems yet. Mm -hmm. We don't have, uh, what we need to see is an epidemic of people taking back the ability to do research, the ability to think, yes. the willingness to have conversations with other people where you're not just looking at your phone across the dinner table, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and until we, we we reclaim those things again, I mean, never mind a right to free speech. We don't have that right if we're mm -hmm. not willing to do the work, yeah. speak well and respectfully in an informed way to other people. Yeah, I mean, my thought on that is quite pessimistic, actually, and I'm, I'm, very, <laughs> and I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. And my belief is that the past two years have been more of a reveal than an innate change. Mm -hmm. I think it's just revealed, you know what they say, when the grass is cut, the snakes will show. And I think it's really revealed how people fundamentally already were. Um, it just took a crisis, whether real or exaggerated or manufactured, mm -hmm. in order for people to be able to see that for the authoritarian nature of certain individuals to come out, for the courageous nature of some people to come out, for the conformist or non-conformist nature to come out because we've largely been, if you live in the West, we've largely been living in, in peacetime our entire lives, right? Life's At that, yeah. Things that things have been peaceful, things have been easy. And I mean, my, my, my generation in the West, I mean, there's, there hasn't been any, any, any real struggle. There haven't been wars. There haven't been uh, plagues or famines or quite, quite the opposite. Right. I think most yeah. of the problems that exist in the modern West are problems of abundance. The problems of things being too easy, too mm -hmm. comfortable. There's too much. Nobody's dying of starvation. People are dying because they're eating too much, right? Mm -hmm. There's just so much excess and abundance. And number one, Earth that makes excess. Yeah, it makes people less vigilant, but mm -hmm. it also makes people more. I think it makes people more anxious. It makes people more depressed because we need struggles as, as human beings. You need you need a form of struggle. If I think of the things that make me different and make me stand out, it's often me. You know, everyone, in, we have to invent our own struggles and there's positive ways and negative ways to do that. When I go to the gym and I'm lifting heavy weights, then people are, why are you lifting all these weights? What? It's like, why are you even trying to get stronger? You're strong enough. It's like, I have to create hardship, right? I have to create, <laughs> I, right? I, I have to create my own hardship. Yeah. I have to create yeah. my own hardship for physical and mental reasons. I have to go out and make my life harder than it could be. If you just live and live, live the easiest life possible, then you know, you end up fat, you end up lazy, you're feeling bad, you have no energy, you're not attractive, so on and so forth. To be all of the, the opposite of these things, you have to go out there and, as Jordan Peterson says, right, carry a load. You have to create hardship. You have to make things more difficult than they could be. So I think everybody does this, but I've explained some healthy ways to do it. I think there's also some really unhealthy ways to do it. And those unhealthy ways are to create, create mountains out of molehills. So every minor threat like one thing we've really seen is that you know people can't some people can't deal with any threat or risk whatsoever right okay. a, z a 0.01% probability of something that's too much that's too much we can't deal with that we can't live with it we need to take all of these measures we need to be very draconian because there's that tiny tiny minimal risk and on a deeper and perhaps philosophical level I've thought about this a lot um Julie is that I think in the modern west people are, have become so uncomfortable with our own mortality. People are really incredibly uncomfortable with sickness and in death. We are behaving, not we individually, but generally, we are behaving as if prior to 2020, no one used to get sick or die. That's how we've been behaving. We are behaving as if before 2020, People used to live forever. We were all immortal. And that no one else gets sick or dies now no. either, except from COVID. Because no, that's oh yeah, there's oh there's no other diseases. There's no other diseases. There's no other there's no other threats. I mean, because I'll I'll be talking and someone will say, oh, you know, Zuby, like you know, five million people have died worldwide of this. I'm like, 
Do you realize that in that same time frame, 120 million people have died of other things? You don't even know that number. You don't care. You were never told to care. You're not aware of it. Many of those people would have been much younger average ages. Um, but people are almost expecting everyone to live forever. So I think that a yeah. lot of the response has just been because, you know, I think perhaps society used to be too comfortable with death. I think that's a good argument, right? That people used to be too comfortable with death and human life was not kind of valued. Common mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People, human, human life was kind of, you know, it was thrown away unnecessarily in many cases, you know, mm -hmm. two men get in an argument with each other. Let, let's, I challenge you to a duel and one of you dies, right? Like that's pretty dumb. Um, <laughs> but I think, I think we've overcorrected so hard now that it's like <laughs> right. pe 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 people are almost trying to, we, we know we don't live forever. Life has a hundred percent mortality rate, but yeah, people are so uncomfortable with sickness, threat, risks, death, that we're willing to give up all of, we're willing to give up freedom, give up civil liberty, give, give up all of these things, give up the future to some degree so that, you know, right now we can just, let's exist, right? It's not even about living really. It's like staying alive. There's a difference between living and staying alive. <laughs> it's just like, let's just stay alive. Yes. And there's no, there's no emphasis on the, on the living part, right? There's no, no emphasis on flourishing, developing mm -hmm. oneself, looking to the future. Now, I think someone on the other side might say, well, of course not, because we're in a crisis, we're in an emergency, we can't, and it's not rational. It's not, it's not reasonable to think about anything beyond that. But can I, can I jump in and say something? Yeah. An emergency cannot last for two years. If it lasts for two years, it's not an emergency. <laughs> there's no such thing as a two year emergency. You can have a two year war. There's no such thing as a two-year emergency. <laughs> well, and it may not be two years. We're not out of it. <laughs> yeah, true. We're not going to be talying about this in five years again. It's also kind of a seven-year emergency going. Yeah, I think by definition, yeah. it's not an emergency if it goes on that long. This is so interesting when you're talking about this sort of uh, seemingly irrational focus on this one thing that can harm us or this one thing that might kill us, right? We, uh, in philosophy, call this asymmetric consequences. So mm. if there's something that's very unlikely to happen, uh, but if it happens, it's very bad, then we tend to focus on that thing, right? And I think there's a certain, uh, like it's, it's natural to do that psychologically. But again, to bring it back to critical thinking, reason is supposed to kick in and say to ourselves, okay, sure, it is very scary if that, I mean, if that did happen, it would be a very terrible thing. If my house uh, burned down in a fire, that would be a very terrible thing. But an equally, if not more terrible thing is to be allow my allow myself to be paralyzed by that fear to the point where I can't do anything else, you know, and to go back to your um, really interesting sort of workout um, example where you have to go through the pain in order to get something <laughs> good. Well, there's an interesting, I guess we'd call it psychological uh, sort of equivalent to that that's been embedded in the history of our literature, going back to the Greeks, which is this idea of catharsis, right? We love this. People would go and watch tragedies so that they could watch something horrible happening to someone else and, and have the opportunity to kind of, it's almost like you're putting your emotions through the washing machine and, and you get to have them work out, but not in a way that makes you really vulnerable. You're not really risking anything big, but then you leave the theater and you feel like, Oh, oh, thank goodness I could, you know, I've got that out of my system. I'm purged. I can, you know, I can go on. And there is a part of me that wonders if we enjoy being hamstrung by fear, if we enjoy having our emotions caught up in something, if nothing else, it gives our lives purpose right now. Yes. And we were talking earlier about how we've been able to download so many of the tasks we've had to do in the past to other people or to other systems or whatever. Um, and a lot of people now, you see this on social media, uh, maybe not so much now, but earlier on when the masking mandates and all of that was, you know, getting going. You see people saying things like, well, at least I got up and wore my mask today, so I accomplished something. Mm. So the the wearing the masks, the getting vaccinated, the the tweeting politically correct pro narrative comments, all of that gives some meaning to a day that may otherwise not have felt like it had any meaning. But it does have meaning. You know, one of the things that I think, um, you know, the the post postmodernism has shown us is that the what it is to be human, like the struggle to be human, that 
rolling this, you know, Sisyphus rolling the stone up the hill only to have it roll back down on him every single day, every single time. Um, yes, life can be empty. It can feel empty. It can feel like you're doing the same thing over and over again. It can feel aimless or pointless, but we always have the choice to do something different. We always have. And that's what the beauty of humanity consists in, right? It's you can't control everything that goes on in the world around you. You can't control whether or not, you can't control perfectly whether you're going to get a virus or not. You can't control perfectly how, like what day you're going to die or if you will die or how long you will live. But we can control what goes on in our own inner, inner mental lives. We can control the choices we make. We can control to some extent our disposition. We can control what we want to say and who we want to say it to. And I think that kind of, like self-affirming value of human existence, we've lost that. Mm -hmm. But it's within our power to get it back again. There, there is hope because we can get it. Now, I, I'm not saying it's not reasonable to be kind of pessimistic as you're being, mm -hmm. but it's um, whether or not people will embrace that ability to affirm their own existence is, is a further question. But I think it's important for us to realize that being caged like we've been is not inevitable. Mm -hmm. We do this to ourselves. We allow this to happen oh, to yeah. ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, um, see, I think part of my pessimism is because, I, as I said before, I, I think this is just how humans are and always have been. And I think that, you know, almost any human trait is, is, on, a, is on a bell curve. And you're always going to have those different types of people. And some people are off, very authoritarian and they're always going to be, they've, they've always existed. They want to tell people what to do. There's never been a better time in history for people who like to tell what people what to do. There's never been a better, it doesn't matter if you're an average what person on the street or like, you're a flight attendant or your person at the door of a restaurant or you're an employer or you're what for people or a politician, those yeah. people who get off on telling other people what to do and how mm -hmm. to behave, pull your mask up over your nose, wear your mask, do this, stand here, walk down, right? They've been having a field day. Those of us who like to be left alone, it's been a it's been an absolute nightmare. It's been a, it's been a complete nightmare. Um, here's a thought I have. I'm going to float another hypothesis to you, and this is something I've, I've thought about. I've never I've done no biological or scientific exploration into this idea, but I have an idea that people have, um, like our bodies have a baseline level of what you could call, I guess anxiety right as human we're always trying to stay alive okay and we've grown up in environments where there's always all kinds of risks environmental risks human risks um you know food risks all all kinds of things and as life has become easier and easier and more comfortable we still have this baseline level of anxiety which needs to be expelled in some direction. As, as we discussed, you can expel this through physical exercise. You can expel this through creative activity. You can expel this through going out physically, moving, running, dancing, swimming, whatever it is. And I think that this links into a lot of the rising mental health problems that are going on, which is that if it's not expelled, it just it just it just mounts up. And I and I think that even when you're seeing lots of the emotional outbursts and a lot of the fighting, whether that's political or you're going on Twitter and you're just seeing people acting like crazy people or whatever, it's like I think all of this stuff is just built up and it's now it has to be expelled somehow. It has to be expelled in some way, shape, or form. And it's going out in very negative ways, right? I'm go, well, let's I'm gonna go scream at that random person online, or I'm gonna go attack this thing, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh exaggerate a certain risk or a certain fear and I'm going to go out and I'm going to expend it that way. So mm -hmm. I have this idea that there's almost like a baseline. There's, there's a baseline level of anxiety that we need to survive, right? Fight or flight. It's always there. Our ancestors, our ancestors were, you know, they would have had to ru run away from an animal or go and farm or do this physical activity or go and run and fetch water, whatever it is. So mm -hmm. it was always, it was always being expelled. Whereas I think with modern human beings, it's there and it's just building up and it's there. And I mean, it's interesting when I hear people, I've never heard more people saying things like, you know, I have anxiety, right? Yeah. I, I, even as a child, I don't Children remember people. Crippling kinds of mm. stress disorders and can't sleep. And yeah. yeah. Not and... Just years. I mean, that's kind of been increasing over the last decade. Mm -hmm. I think. 
Mm -hmm. And then when you introduce things like lockdowns and isolation and all of that, cover people's faces so they're not even communicating properly, it's like, wow, you've just created a, there were already a lot of mental health problems in our societies mm -hmm. and you've just created the perfect storm now, right? They've created this perfect storm for that to just amp up even more. Um, even people like myself who are extraordinarily low, low neuroticism and very resistant <laughs> to any kind of, you know, I'm in like the bottom 1% of the population for that trait. And even like in the height of the lockdowns, I was even like, cause I, I was, you know, I was living by myself and I'm like, dude, man, like this is, <laughs> this is rough. Like this is, this is unpleasant. I mean, this yeah. is how they treat pr prisoners. And even, even though I, I mean, I was still going out and about and doing things, but there was nowhere to go. Um, a lot of other people were scared. So it wasn't easy to like meet up with other people. So it was so isolating and, um, I, I think it's also just been so overlooked how much human interaction matters. Human interaction yeah. matters so much. What, yeah. Last last thing I'll say on this I'll, um, is I've heard so many people say, so even, even say, take something simple like with the mask, with the masks, right? Mm -hmm. I hear people say all the time, you know, because if you say, look, there's no, there's very little, there's no conclusive evidence that this is really working or helping. And people say, well, what's, what's the harm? It doesn't do any harm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how you don't see you don't see the harm that's done by this you think this is just like a neutral activity that's potentially benefit but no cost i mean mm -hmm. that shows how far human beings have removed been been removed from from our nature where you don't think like, how do you not realize how important it is for to be able to see people's faces and see their expressions and see their mouth moving like it's it, it's hard to quantify but it's extremely important but the, but we are very um amenable to to this kind of incremental creep right yes. i think you can get human beings to do just about anything if you in, introduce uh if you, if you break down the complex task or the big leap that you want to introduce to them into small bits and i remember watching um i'm not really a watcher of the view and so i don't really know the names of the the hosts but i remember there was one of the hosts maybe a month ago now and she was on saying that uh, so she's very de in, in defense of all of the, the COVID measures and mandates mm -hmm. and everything. And she said, well, you know, we just have to get used to these encroachments on our liberty and it'll be OK, because look at post 9-11. Then we introduced all of these increased security measures at the airport and now we're just used to it and we don't think about it. And without getting into, you know, whether or not that's a good analogy or whether or not those increased security measures were good or not, I think she does make she's a very good example of this this point that. Yeah, I think a lot of people are willing to do just about anything um, as long as it's been introduced in the right way, in a slow enough way, over a long enough period of time. And um, this idea of yours that the, you know, we need to reach a threshold level of anxiety before we have to have it purged. Um, I also wonder if when we have a threshold level of anxiety, we need it justified in some way. Mm -hmm. Right. So if we feel like, you know, we feel, gee, I, I can't sleep and I'm anxious and I feel neurotic and I'm worried all the time. Well, there must be a reason for that. Otherwise, I'm crazy. Yes. Otherwise, I'm irrational. So I need to find a cause. I need to mm -hmm. exert all of my mental energy to figure out, well, what is the cause of this? We're in a pandemic. No wonder yes. I feel anxious. Yes. And in order to build that story, I need to make sure that that is a real threat mm -hmm. to which only a rational person would be angry. It's a fantastic and, point. Yeah. And, and, and aside from, and, and I don't think, I mean, I think you're making the point and I agree with you, which is that this, this build towards anxiety is not, it's not just a two year phenomenon, right? This, this has been going on longer. Um, but we need maybe a surrogate then when we get out of this one, we need something else to justify our level of anxiety unless we're going to deal with it. And then back to the, you know, point about catharsis, it might just be the case that, this is just human nature, right? We just feel anxious and unsettled and concerned about things because again, we're imperfect, you know, back to that idea. We're, we're imperfect. We, we don't always process all of our emotions in exactly the most efficient way all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and so we kind of cycle through, right? We go through periods of fear and stress and uncertainty and irrationality. And then we need to come out of that somehow. Well, how have we come out of it in the past? entertainment is a great way to do it right mm -hmm. and we can watch these movies with heroes and villains and catastrophes but we don't really have to be part of it but now why have we had to fabric well i don't i don't i don't mean to be too disparaging but if it's the case 
that we do feel the need to tell a story of fear to justify our anxiety, um, then how are we going to work our way out of that? So if we're not purging that anxiety by watching a movie or reading a literature, you know, a book about a tragic mm -hmm. hero that does it for us, how are we going to do that? Um, sliding out of these mandate situations, I don't think is going to be enough. I don't think that deals with the anxiety. That doesn't make mm -hmm. it all go away. I think we need to get people moving. I think, I think physically. one of the physically, I think something that's totally overlooked in, in our society is this compartmentalization between physical and mental health. There's a gigantic mm -hmm. overlap. It's, it's, if someone is in good physical shape and is eating well, getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, training, exercising regularly, mm -hmm. that has a big impact. Right. I think it's crazy that in places like the US and perhaps across the whole Anglosphere, you know, if someone is feeling anxious or depressed or, you know, what the, okay, what can we prescribe them? It's all, you know, it's, it's all prescriptions, you know, pills, 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 well, you know, or let's, now, or now we're down to it, I think, because what you're yeah. describing is a very poor way of making money. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm, oh, I understand why it's not done. I understand why it's not done for sure. Right. Um, it's, it's uncontroversial. It's not complicated. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of journalistic ink that can be oh, no. you know, spent on it. Um, I, I just think that should be the first, that should obviously be the first port of call. Let's look at your lifestyle. Let's look at your lifestyle and see what's going on there. If all of those things are on point and good and okay, they're still an issue, then I'm more willing to be like, okay, maybe, maybe there's, there's something, there's something deeper there. Maybe there's, I don't know, some imbalance. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of these things, but there's something there, but that step is just completely skipped over and physical and the mental are talked about like two totally separate entities. And any, anyone who, anyone who, who exercises or does any type of training or sports or whatever, you know that these things are inextricably linked. There's another point you made earlier, Julie, which I just want to touch on a little bit, which is interesting about the, the story um, being told to justify the anxiety. Mm -hmm. One interesting thing I've noticed in the past two years is I believe this is the first pandemic in history where a significant number of people want it to be worse than it is. People want it to be worse and more severe and more deadly than it is in reality. And people get angry. People get upset with you if you even give real statistics, certain statistics. So for example, if you talk about survival rates, people get very, very angry with you. Um, or if you say anything that plays down the supposed deadliness of this particular virus. And that is extremely fascinating and bizarre. It's like people want to be afraid. You, you try to alleviate someone's fear or concern and it doesn't do it. You've even got people, you know, they're out there, they've, they've triple quadruple vaxxed. They've got two <laughs> masks on. Yes. Yeah. I mean, any, everyone wearing a mask is vaxxed at this point. Like anyone who's still out there wearing a mask, yeah, around outside, like, yeah. So it's like, they don't want to alleviate the fear. It's really strange. It's like, you've done all these steps and all these mitigation measures to, yeah. you know, you've, you've taken a threat, which already was small, right? Let's say, let's say you're talking about a young, healthy person. Okay. Mm -hmm. The risk of you, you risk of you getting hospitalized, let alone dying of COVID is extraordinarily small. This is just a fact, right? Yeah. Hard fact right? Lower than 0.1%, considerably lower if uh, it's in many cases. So, and then if you, okay, say someone takes two, three, three shots on top of that. So you're taking something that's already a tiny, tiny risk. Mm -hmm. You're, you're making it even tinier. Uh, or best. so they believe. Then, I'm not sure yeah. that's true. But okay. The, I, I'm saying at best, right? Best case scenario, according to the story, yeah. <laughs> according to the story, you're, you're making it even lower. You're, you've gone from 99.95 survival rate to 99.9 eight, right? And then on top of that, you're yeah. still afraid of interacting. You're still afraid of going and living life normally. And if someone even suggests to you, you know, if you hear what I'm saying right now, you're getting angry, you're getting triggered. Why is he downplaying it? Why is he? And it's so strange because normally people welcome news that make them know that a, a, a risk or a threat is much lower than it is, right? If, if you walk outside and, you know, I don't know, you, you leave your house, you, you leave the, you leave the toaster on, you leave the oven on, right. And you leave and you go and travel and you, oh my gosh, I hope my, you know, it's something. And then you call a neighbor and your neighbor's like, the house isn't on fire. I turned off the oven. Whew, relief, right? Good. Yeah. The, the risk isn't what I thought it was. 
um, you don't get angry at them because they destroyed the narrative that you had in your head about the risk. Mm -hmm. uh, so I as you're talking, I'm honestly, what I'm thinking in my head is this is fascinating. <laughs> and I have no idea why people do it, but it's just occurred to me. I just have a thought and you, you tell me what you think. Um, the difference between the, oh, I have relief. I didn't leave the stove on example. And, oh, COVID isn't as bad as I thought it was. One difference is that the first is an individual isolated experience of fear. Mm. And the second one is not, right? It's a collective experience of fear. Mm. And I do kind of wonder, I mean, I've thought about this a lot lately. Like we, we do seem to like being in states. We pay people to put us into states of fear. We, <laughs> We, we go to the scary movies. We like Halloween. We like horror. You know, we, we jump off things we should not mm. jump off of. <laughs> like, we seem to like to be in a state of fear, some of us more than others. But um, the thing about this COVID fear is that it puts us all in the same boat, mm. right? It At a time when we are, um, we're so isolated, a lot of us work from even before COVID, right? We work at home or in our own little pods. We're on our phones. We feel so disconnected from other people. We don't, you know, go out and have conversations. We, we're just not very connected to other people anymore. Um, now this COVID thing has given us something to talk about with others, something to do with others. We put on our COVID uniforms. We put on our masks. We virtue signal with others, right? Like, is it possible that the, the reason we don't want to give this up is because we will have lost our connection. Mm -hmm. The only yeah. connection that a lot of us have, the only meaning we have. And it, it gives us something to talk about with other people, something to do with other, something to commiserate about. Mm -hmm. um, if it goes away, if the reports on the news, if they stop talking about COVID, if they say, oh, case numbers are going, going down, you can go back to your life. Isn't there kind of a feeling of emptiness, like, oh, mm -hmm. well, what was yeah. my life? Oh, for for plenty of people, for millions of people, yeah. for sure. For what, millions what of I people. Do now? Where do I get where do I get meaning now? Mm. What is the story that defines this moment of my life, this era in history? Mm -hmm. I mean, the COVID narrative has given the people of 2020 to 2022 an electrified moment in human history that will be written about. For decades, I think centuries. Mm. And they can play the hero in it as well. They can play the hero by doing all the right things. Mm -hmm. And shouting at everyone who doesn't. They've got the villains right there. So you're a hero and a villain all wrapped into one, right? Depends on who you are. Yeah, it depends on one's perspective. And yeah, no, I think you're totally correct. I've compared COVID-19 to a religion many, many times. And I, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. I'm a religious person. I'm not saying that in any disparaging way. I'm talking about the sense of purpose, meaning, community. That's something that you you touched on, having a narrative, having a story, having mm -hmm. some course of redemption, having an, an enemy, an invisible enemy, even. Um, there are a lot of parallels. Yeah, I've, I've compared vaccination to baptism. Um, I've compared. Sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's a sacrament. Wear, wearing the mask, it's, it's, a, it's a ritual. You know, it's a ritual. Uh, you know, someone walks into a restaurant, they put on their mask, they take 10 steps to their seat and they sit down, they take it off, they stand up again an hour later, put it back on. You know, they're following, they're following a, a, a ritual. Um, it's not scientific. <laughs> it's not, it's not logical. But, yeah, um, it's both horrifying and beautiful. I mean, if we think about <laughs> well, ritual is what binds us together. I mean, rituals are, you think about rituals to do with marriage ceremonies or uh, the ritual of, of the, the, the communion at, at church or rituals to do with shaking hands when you, or, or taking shoes off when you go, depending on what your culture is. Or um, rituals are like patterns of behavior that have meaning in a culture. And um, if we give all of these up, all of these COVID rituals up, well, we've lost that meaning. Do we have a substitute? Church. Go to church, guys. <laughs> well, you can't now unless you're vaccinated and wear your mask. So, <laughs> you know. Is that the rule in Canada? Well, pretty much. Really? You can't go to church without proof of vaccination? Views, right? So, I mean, I'm not quite sure what the immunological rationale is to that, but they're like vaccinated people in some churches and unvaccinated. Unbelievable. 
Yeah, it's it's really disappointed me the fact that more uh, religious leaders have not stood up to this tyranny. I've been hugely disappointed by that. Yeah, well, the Catholics, you know, I mean, there's, the Pope has been very clear about his position. And... It's sad, man. You know, it's like they 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 gave it all up to, they gave it all up to the uh, Fauci's of the world, the so-called experts and politicians, and I think actually spiritual leadership has been massively missing over the past couple of years. I think really this was a time where you need that. People need a message of hope. People need something deeper, you know, because as we've said, if people don't have something deeper, they're more likely to get caught in, I don't know, they're caught in this, this crossfire and web of these very strange narratives and mm -hmm. tribalism and the demonization of anyone who isn't 100% on board with all they're doing. I mean, we're, it's literally just at the stage of puni punishing heretics and non-believers. That's where we've been for the past six months or so. That's all that's going on. Like there's no, it's not science. It's not, it's not logical. It's not saving lives. It's not helpful. It's not about health. It's just at the point of, okay, you're a non-believer. You must be punished. Um, and that's what's going on. Well, I think the, the point you make is, I mean, a lot of people have said that, I mean, there are hashtags about science or trust the science that stand mm -hmm. in for giving any kind of argument, right? But I think science is, it has become um, the religion of the modern world. But what's worse than that is that what we're calling science is really a kind of pseudoscience because mm -hmm. it's just using the word science over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, I mean, we've, we don't have time to talk about all of this, but all of this sort of um, corrupt regulatory capture stuff going mm -hmm. on, that is not science, right? I mean, we've kind of made a sort of pseudoscience. Yes. Um, our, scientism. Scientism, our spiritual leader. And as you say, anyone who falls out of line with that leader is, is just going to be scapegoated. Mm -hmm. And I mean, leaders of the past, I, I can't help but think of someone like Churchill, you know, in the, in during the second world war in England, because that messaging, you know, was like, keep calm and stable and carry on. And yes. leaders should be morally stabilizing, not morally bifurcating. Mm -hmm. And now we're seeing the world's leaders just threatening people and, yeah religious leaders threatening people. How dare you mm -hmm. fall out of line, right? But um, we need our leaders to get us on an even keel again and bring us together again and restore faith in the fact that we have a mind and a soul and a body. And as you've said, these things all work together. And when one part is not doing very well, it's out of balance. It can't mm -hmm the others you know i think the ancient greeks had this pretty right that the, the person is whole it's a it's a psychosomatic system and um we are just we, we we also think that the only kind of experts that matter are scientific experts but they're not the only people who have something to say about what it is to be human no you know no. there are also religious experts and philosophical experts and artistic experts and mm -hmm. legal i mean there are a lot of people and and Outside of that, I mean, there are people who are experts in animal care and people who are expert potters. And we, we just have this incredible tunnel vision or myopia about what counts as knowledge and who gets to say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Until we fix all of those problems, <laughs> I think we're just going to have another COVID pandemic situation in a few years. So mm. come on, people, let's get these things fixed. You know? oh, amen. Julie, where do you think Canada goes from here? Well, uh, I've been in interviews all morning, so I don't know what's gone on in the house this morning. I'm a little afraid. <laughs> These days I open, you know, Twitter. Oh, or no. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, sort of peaking. I'm a little afraid. Yeah. Like, has our country imploded yet? Has there been an assassin? I don't know. I mean, you oh just go gosh. in these days. Um, I think where we can go from here is that we can gain a little sanity and stability. Um, I think we, we we can no longer have the current government that we have in power or anything like it. And we need to learn a lesson from that. And by that, I don't mean to be partisan. I don't mean that there's a problem with liberals over conservatives per se. There's a problem with um, silencing and canceling over freedom of speech and other crucial civil liberties that make us who we are. Absolutely. And Julie, where can people find and follow you online? 
Yeah, uh, so I have a Twitter page and an Instagram page, Dr. Julie Panessi, and they can also go to the democracyfund.ca. And uh, my book, uh, My Choice, has a book page called uh, mychoicebook.ca. Awesome. So we can like all those things if you like. Julie Panessi, thank you so much for coming on the Real Talk with Zuby show. This has been one of my favorite conversations. It's lovely. Thank you so much. You're welcome.